play that has 60 different locations. I can do Mr. Pickwick, and we're going to have an incredible cricket match, and there's not a ball, there's not a bat, there's nothing, there's air, and everybody is gasping with excitement because they can see the cricket match. You can actually see the ball. So he took all that stuff that I think nowadays people aren't believing in anymore. And he made us invent out of air and, make, and, and captivate an audience with the physical and visual truth of what we were doing. One of the reasons he did that was because George was a visual artist. He was a commercial artist. And he had a tremendously strong visual sense. Another reason is that George believed that everybody is a musician. So he put a trombone in my hands when I had to do Mr. Bones. And my husband, whom I met in the company with George, um, he remembers uh, trying to get to sleep at night with me sitting up in bed practicing my trombone for Mr. Bones. He would say, if you can tell the difference between this and this, you can sing. <laughs> I am so glad that I had somebody in my life who never let go of those truths. He never wavered. He was strict. He was a fascist. He was dominating. He was awful to work with. He was bad-tempered. We were terrified of him. But every day, every day, he invited us to follow the same discipline over and over and over again. And to me, for me today, this is in my bones. I teach the efforts. Um, the, last thing, uh, the last time I worked on, uh, I teach in Humber College in Fanshawe. The last time I did, I said to Fanshawe, uh, the college students, okay, now that you know all the efforts, um, and it's near Christmas, we've got four hours. Let's do Christmas Carol. And at one point, I just stopped talking to them because the actors, and there were 20 of them, created Marley's ghost and they all became the chains because they all knew what they were doing. So there was this incredible moment when the actor were, was ringing, and that's one of the movements, and, and the rest of the cast were just following with the sound, you know, vocal sort of guttural sounds of chains. So that was so thrilling. And you can, imp you can have 20 people improvising. When you teach them a rigorous fundamental discipline of empty space, your body in space, you can, uh, you know, and he used to sometimes just walk away and have a smoke while we were busy doing this incredible stuff, <laughs> building empires, and then he'd come back and, you know. So, so for me, that's why I'm speaking to you all, because I want to remind you all that, you know, once you go into a discipline, it is worth training it in it as thoroughly and intensely as an opera singer or a ballet dancer. They're not the only disciplines around that should be so f intensely focused on. Theatre is not a casual thing. That's what George taught me. Oh, you want me? Oh, you want me? <laughs> I never thought much of the efforts. <laughs> <laughs> I hated it. I hated it because yeah. I found, like, yeah. Comrade George was just ramming this stuff for which worked all right for people who are very clumsy and couldn't move at all. <laughs> uh, I, uh, but it's a, it's a mark and a tribute to Luskin that I can stand here and say that I loathed one of his basic principles, <laughs> and yet there was still enough there to kind of bring me uh, around there, an interest in it. When I went to the theater with 10 Lost Years as a project to do, uh, I had in my mind from the beginning that this was going to be a template for a new kind of Canadian musical that would not be going down on Broadway. This is what I felt in 1974, that we had a country that was filled with brilliant songwriters and the Canadian English theater was not connecting to that material, not using that material at all. And that what there was the opportunity with this, because the material of 10 Lost Years is not just oral history, it's oral literature, it's <coughs> poetry, it's found the material there. And there was a tough time working with a lot of this stuff with George because he was not really into, as Maya said, he was very much into visual and the productions and, and the text was a secondary thing. I'm gonna just do a quick little demonstration of something. I thought up here, because what I was so amazed with this early material, I was living out in the country at the time that I was reading it, and uh, I had a next door neighbor who I went to with a tape recorder and asked him about the depression, and it was the way that people spoke, the way the words tumbled from out of uh, did you ever see him uh, ride the box car? Oh, I haven't seen him. I used to do it myself. 
you know, and everyone, uh, I was working, you know what I mean. And, and I knew the conductor, he's gonna be right. She'd say no, but when she starts slacking up in the hoo ha ha. And you do this a little bit, because uh, this is one of the stories where I found this song, this little bit of a song, every one of these song lyrics is right there within the story that uh, this woman tells. I love the lungs of a train at night Moving down the valley A call to other places Where things might be right As I lay in my bed I love the sound of the train Telling me to escape Get away through the mountains. Oh, maybe romance, if you really think so. But to get away. I mean, I was 19, I had teachers training, and I had given anything for the chance. But no, no, there was dear, sweet Margaret at home with a family that was dying. I used to say that if the rest of the country was like us, lost and dying on 200 acres of Saskatchewan land, then Canada was finished. But there was always that train, and I would wait moments before it was to come by. A passenger train going to Vancouver, or to Winnipeg, then on to Toronto. side of, of this. I, I was the practical one. Jo <laughs> jo George hated me. <laughs> but, well, he didn't, I don't think he hated me personally. What, what, he didn't, what he didn't want was like uh, production values. He, he, he couldn't say, um, you couldn't say no to George, right? Uh, this one being Shirley Temple in a play we did. He, he, wanted, he wanted the idea of Shirley Temple on the screen. So to get the idea of the screen, she couldn't cast a shadow. Try to explain that to George. <laughs> <coughs> so we, we, we had little, little tiffs <laughs> about, about things like that, because reality was not going to get in the way of his production. Um, <laughs> but it's true. It's, it's true. Um, the, the concept of 10 Lost Years, like 10 Lost Years to me is one of these perfect examples of a, of a text-based piece, right? You, as a lighting person or as a technician, the, the best thing to approach a play like this is, is to get the hell out of the way, right? You, you want to see the people, you want to augment, if you can, what they're talking about, but you sure as hell don't want to take anything away from them. I get so annoyed now when I go to theater, even as a lighting piece, and for a person that sit and watch the bear lights spin, it just drives you crazy. Unless you're there to watch the bear lights spin, which is, you know, what Cirque du Soleil is doing. Um, <laughs> But, but this piece, it, well, when I went into Tr Toronto Workshop, uh, I had been in Barry <coughs> as production manager, and the stage manager was a friend of mine, and she called me down. They had absolutely no money, right? We had 32 lamps and 13 dimmers. All the dimmers were manual. I had very turn ones and these things, right? So I had 10 of those. You know, <coughs> just in context, I now work with 800, right? But I, <coughs> but I had 13. <laughs> and if, in those days, if a, if a bulb burned out, you just talk in the dark, right? Because we couldn't afford a bulb. Right? But um, we stole a few. But. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding, we did. <laughs> we, we, Astor Jansen and I used to know how to get into the Kremlin, which was the CBC building. <laughs> so we'd walk down to the end of Alexander Street and sneak in. That's how we, that's how we Xerox stuff, because they had <laughs> We did a lot of that. Um, so the concept for the piece was, was as I say, it, it's about the text, it's about the actor. So we had a, a set of platforms, right? And the only way I could approach it was that each actor had a home base, 
or George approached it that way, but in terms of lighting it, there were, <clears throat> everybody had a home, like a rocking chair, you know, or something that they sat in. So they would come possibly forward or not and do, <clears throat> do, do their, their bet and then kind of retreat back into it. We had two production numbers. One was the radio. Hey, hey, it's fantasy radio hour. Time to put your cares away. I remember that after 35 years. I can't remember my own bloody phone number, but I can remember that. Um, there was that, and then there was the train. So the, the train part was considered to be extremely important. And the idea, the, the idea that we decided on with Astrid Jansen, who's brilliant, was the uh, Toronto Workshop was, was a space like this. that had bleachers more or less at one end, and then it just went for bloody ever to the back. The nice thing was that there were no sideline problems because everybody was at a square end, so everybody could see everything. And there were, there was, it got narrower as it got to the back. So what we did is we used just three long, thin rectangles of light going back, getting smaller as they went back. We actually moved the boxcars by tying ropes to the grid and going like this, right? And you could make the pipe shake. So you got the sense that the, the trains were. You know. <coughs> and we, we, well, we were primitive out there. Um, <laughs> and we had, we had one light coming from like head height from the back that was, had a gobo in it with little red dots. So you, you wanted to get the sense of smoke and sparks flying back across. You know, when they went into a tunnel, people died, right? Because they, they had to deal with the smoke and the sparks. So that, that was the one thing, and we could have the actors running back and forth, jumping from boxcar to boxcar. And we also had a side light that would go on and off like this to get the sense of passing, <coughs> passing lamp posts. Because there's a, there's a bit in the play about trying to jump off a boxcar and not hit the post, right? Because you, you have to jump on the slowing down because there will be police when it stops, right? So we had to get off of the smooth. So we, we, that, that's, where, that's where we put the money stuff, right? In, in, those, in those two sections. And they were the only two group sections. The other fascinating thing about it that, that's already been mentioned but <coughs> was about the sound. There was no recorded sound. Right? Like, well, we didn't. didn't I think once there we had dripping water in Captain Coconut or something. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, there, there, was, yeah. there was a sound booth oh, yeah. opposite, yeah. opposite you. Yeah, there was nobody but... in it. But I, was... <laughs> <laughs> I still don't like sound booths. <laughs> um, but the, the, the idea of the train was all done on stage. Everybody went down the basement or whatever. This yeah. one was sitting there with this gigantic pot that she, scr she scratched into to get, the <coughs> to get the sound of a train. They had, and they had um, posts, uh, like a, a coat tree, with pots and pans on it. Go, but the sound of that train starting was just unbelievable, like the three shunts as the train you know, would speed up. Scare the hell out of the audience, because they didn't know what they were going to do. Right? But it was all coming from there, and it was all, it was all that whole organic organic part, and, um, and, and then, then it, would, it would go right back down to, again to a single voice and a single light. We didn't go to black anywhere else. Nobody ever left the stage, so you never went to black. You just kind of drifted over to another person. And I spent you know, my life just kind of slowly you know, bringing up, <coughs> just, just to try and get the thing fluid. We had, no, no, we had a stage manager, but she was not on headset, so I was running off a script. So that was my part of being part of this whole process. Like, I didn't... I didn't have to do the same thing every night. If I thought I could make it just a little bit better, a little bit smoother, I could just keep doing it. I mean, now I'm paid a lot of money to push buttons, but and you get the same thing night after night. But in, the, in this case, you were you were putting English on stuff and and, and having a great time. But I can remember <coughs> I can remember crying night after night after night. And the, the, again, this one doing my son Raoul, my son the vegetable. It was just a lady sitting in a rocking chair, <coughs> talking about her son who sat. Yeah, all the way through the Depression on a farm in Saskatchewan and did absolutely nothing. And then joined, <coughs> finally at the end of the Depression, <coughs> went away to war and died. And, but finally had something to do. And uh, at the end it says, his chaplain wrote and said he died bravely. I still have that letter. When I die, when I leave, I have told my daughter I want the letter in my hands, in the coffin, you understand. And I could cry night after night after night. But, and, uh, we, we did it at the end of the show at one point, and we, could, we couldn't stop the end the show with it because everybody was crying. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended it with the march for Come On Boys and Turn the Army. And you would slam to black and try slamming 13 dimmers to black. <laughs> <laughs> when three of them are rotary. <laughs> we had strings tied to them. And all that. But, but we would slam to black, and by the time you could get lights up on stage again, the audience would be up and yelling. And this went like for weeks and weeks and weeks. So I discovered, like I came in a little bit late and about two weeks before this thing opened, you suddenly started getting 